Well, I'm David Allen, and in the 1980s, I was the editor and producer, series producer, for the Computer Literacy Project, as the BBC called it, um, which was uh, a thing that started in 1979 as a sort of gleam in the eye, and ended up in 1987 when we stopped making the Micro Life series. So there's a massive history, really, in that uh, almost 10 years. And uh, this is Steve, who was vital in most of the uh, television programs that we made because Steve was our, t our techie, our technical coordinator, who actually made things work. I was plucked from a job as a studio engineer working in Studio 5 at Television Centre, looking after programmes, making them work for a variety of programmes. And what felt like quite by accident, they were looking for a volunteer. David's team were looking for someone to make it work on the day because making computers working in the studio in those days was not a trivial affair. Um, many screens didn't work, many computers didn't work, and they wanted someone who had the right, I guess, temperament to do that. They came looking for volunteers, and I ignored the request because they were looking for someone who had a BBC Micro Ready, and I thought, they're not talking to me because I haven't got one. And then they said, what about you, Steve? And it was the best moment in my career because I was obviously a techie, and the, the TV revolution was one thing, but the computer revolution was something else because I was privileged enough through the years, through making the most of the micro, through all the series, including Computers and Control and My Fair yeah. Live, to see many things which people now take too easily for granted, but appearing mm. for the first time, the first laser printer, 3,000 pound for a laser yeah. printer. We met people like Steve Jobs, icons and brilliant people. We met all those people and I met them firsthand. We had access yeah. to the, the people who at the time in the UK were building 100 different computers for sale. First hand, first hand access mm. to do all that. So my core job, David borrowed me to make sure that the studios worked and thank God they did most of the time. Get up at five in the morning, set things up. When the team turned up, most things were working, thank God. Get up at five, you, you didn't sleep. I didn't sleep, that's no, right. absolutely. Because um, quite often in the later days, besides running the studios or making sure the kit from the contributors and ourselves worked on the studio day, um, I was also, given the opportunity, bless it, it was a lovely team who let me do this kind of thing, write scripts, research items, and even direct the old bit as well. You um, went filming with me in America, so we did some programmes at Carnegie Mellon University. Which had the first prototype attempt at things like a read-write CD-ROM, the first time anyone was trying to read and write successfully, repeatedly on a CD-ROM. It was a tatty old chip. We saw breaking technology like that, a unique experience. Yeah. So and we interviewed work. Steve Jobs, who was, if you remember, between jobs. Yes, he was. <laughs> and we weren't allowed to talk about everything with him because he was working on silent stuff. Yes. But he did want to talk about the new, what's it called? The 3M machine, 3 mm. MIPS. It was, yeah. it was all the MIPS we now take for granted, the decent screen, the mouse. The mouse, the icons. Mm. Yes, yeah. yeah, because Carnegie Mellon University was very advanced in having um, workstations for its students. Yep. And he was there kind of learning about it. It was about the time that the, that the mouse and the WIMP interface He was looking at in. their interface yeah. for education, yeah. which in Carnegie Mellon University, they were using computers in every faculty. That's right. History, yeah. the arts, everything. Everyone had to do computing. Yeah. Yeah. And Steve Jobs, quite rightly, brilliant guy, said, OK, if I can talk to these people and see what they want for their learning experience, this will give me a machine that will suit everybody, not just the techie. That's right. So it yeah. was a moment in time to see all that. Well, so it's a good moment to say that, I mean, we were very privileged to be at a, at a turning point in history, really, at the moment when the computer came, if you like, into public consciousness, came into the high street, began to appear in education as a, as a tool and so on and so forth. Asa Briggs, who's the BBC, was the first BBC historian, not the current one, um, has this concept of moments, you know, moments in history, turning points in history when things happen. And the BBC um, came into existence just at the moment when people started um, having radio sets in the, in the house and they stopped being in, you know, in attics with headphones on, you know, tickling uh, cat's whiskers and things like that. And it, it became a popular thing instead of a specialist um, uh, enthusiast thing. And the same thing happened with computers at exactly the moment that we 
for doing this. And at the time, we didn't know that it was important. We really didn't. Well, we thought it was important, but not as important as it turned out to be. I mean, computers have been around. I, I met a computer when I was at school, um, an analog computer, and I asked it to do two times two, and it came up with the answer 3.999. Um, that was my first exposure to a computer. But otherwise, computers were things that, you know... They were kept in the back rooms, weren't they? They were in back rooms. I did electronic yeah. engineering at university, and all yeah. I had for that experience in computing was a view on the last... I think after we'd finished the course, we were allowed to see one four-bit processor on a board about the size of an old child's train set yes. laid out. We were shown that that might be the future. Yeah. And within three years, I was working on series which had those chips included and were doing and capable of doing everything. Control, yeah. input, output, music, graphics. Yeah. It was That's a right. Well, 77 I left university and we were doing, yeah. I, was, I joined the team from about 83. Yeah, but the, the computer project itself started in the late 70s in its embryonic form um, because what happened was uh, there was a very famous Horizon program called Now the Chips Are Down, um, which looked at the, the computer revolution, if you like, and the microelectronics revolution as, as it was being called then. Uh, and people talked about microprocessors and so on and the, and the fact that Britain was not exploiting the technology at all and uh, the government was taking no interest in the, in the thing and it, it ended up by saying, you know, if you listen to the government, what you hear is a resounding silence. And um, that was a very um, important program. It, it catalyzed a lot of things. And one of the things that came out of it uh, very shortly afterwards that um, the BBC were approached by a number 10 um, and saying that there is this technology that we can't quite get a, a grip of, if you like, in, in Britain, and we need to do things. And is there any way that the BBC can do something to raise awareness? So who was the Prime Minister? This was uh, Callaghan. This was the very end of the Callaghan government, just before the winter of discontent and so on and so forth. Um, and I, uh, I didn't know until recently about that meeting, because the first thing I knew about... Um, about the computer thing and how I got involved with it. it was my head of department came up to me uh, in the bar at lunchtime because in those days you did go to the bar at lunchtime and the best ideas came from the bar at lunchtime um, and she says they're talking about this thing called microelectronics and she said a very famous line I want you to see if there's anything in it and um, so I went off and and we went to see various people um, talk to people in think tanks at um, um, various universities and so on, S Sprue and um, uh, Salford and, and, and so on. And then the BBC was offered some money by the Manpower Services Commission. This was a quango, I suppose a, a government quango, which was concerned with um, employment and the structure of employment and what employment needs were and educational needs were and so on. They gave us um, some money to write a report about the microelectronics revolution and about what was going on in various different countries and what the British response should be. And we went to um, Japan, Sweden, France, Germany, America, to all these countries to find out what uh, people were saying within industry, within education, particularly what the unions were saying because the Germans were calling the, mic the chip, they were calling the chip the job killer. And there was a lot of um, sociological anxiety about what the new technology was going to do to employment. And in fact, the Horizon program majors on that. You know, it's going to be really quite revolutionary, as indeed it, it has been. So we went to around the world to, to write this report and really to come up with some conclusions. And the conclusions were, effectively, we need a public awareness campaign. We mustn't have black boxes. We must have um, a technology that is democratic rather than down, you know, uh, controlled from above. And there was a very strong feeling within BBC Education. I should explain this was BBC Education's initiative. Uh, it's a, there was a very big educational um, department in the BBC in those days. It has since disappeared and it had advisory committees from all over the place. It would meet several times a year and exchange ideas about what was uh, necessary, if you like, what sort of output we should produce. Um, and this was clearly 
a subject that was important. Um, and so I was given the job of trying to find out what we should do. Where were we then when you visited the other countries? Where did you feel Britain stood in comparison to other nations? Oh, uh, nowhere at all. I mean, we went to uh, Japanese factories where robots were busily making cars and there were automatic uh, production techniques. Microprocessors were being introduced into all kinds of things. The Japanese were producing little handheld um, calculators. Little, I, I came away with a 1K um, basic uh, uh, compiler on a little tiny uh, computer um, when I was there. We went to factories making numerically controlled machine tools um, and a factory that was selling them around the, around the world. And the awful thing was that they were going to almost every country except Britain. And uh, it was there's, quite sobering. There's still a bit of attitude in the UK you, of, should we just choose to ignore it? Do we really need to get involved? An appalling insular attitude that yeah. you could even think about the possibility of choosing to ignore it. Yeah. Whereas the rest of the world was getting ahead in productivity and capability and we were just saying, well, do we have to bother with this? Yeah. So it was so important to expose people to the rest of the world and what they're already doing. That's right. And the first things we did, and the first, um, I made a, a three-part series called The Silicon Factor, which was um, mid-evening BBC Two. It was you know, quite an important program. This was a raising awareness. This was saying the, the revolution is coming. Why, what's it all about? What, how's it going to affect industry? And what's going to be the social consequences? And that was quite an, in, an interesting program to make. And it got us involved. And it meant going to America and filming people over there and, um, and, and, and so on. And then we made a series um, aimed at small businesses, at, at um, small engineering companies who could incorporate microprocessors in their products and, and so on and so forth. And that was a, a, a series of programs um, fronted by Brian Redhead, the blessed Brian Redhead, who was an absolutely wonderful man. And um, he... Uh, you know, he went to visit factories and looked at people who were interested introducing micros into into products, into small products. The man who invented sonic tape measure, for example, that kind of thing. A, a harpsichord, harpsichordist who used it to tune his, you know, harpsichord or something, like that sort of thing. Anyway, it was a series for small businesses, and that was the sort of thing we made in those days. Uh, but over that was about 1980. And we were beginning to think, hey, there's something more we ought to be doing. But of course, meanwhile, in the high street, you were getting the beginnings of computers that you could, you know, you could buy. They were very expensive, but you could buy a computer and run a program which, you know, is usually green screen on green, sorry, there's usually green text on a, on a, on a, on a, or even on worse, a, on a black screen. Or even worse, a keypad and a little numeric display for yeah. hundred pound I bought from but I mean, there were, That was fairly specialist. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't, in, it wasn't for everybody that was it, that stage of no. computers in the high street before BBC Micro. No, but there were, were things like the, the Tandy TRS-80 and things sure. like that. So you could get them and they had, you know, you could get business packages uh, for them. But there was nothing really that you could get your hands on and do things with. Now, we had this deep philosophical principle, if you like, that we, in order to um, get a grip on computers, if you like, you had to get hold of them and you had to do things with them yourself. That the hands-on philosophy was, was extremely important. And in those days, of course, you, you, what could you do? You could go to the Edgware Road and you could buy a kit of parts and build a computer. You could do microelectronics at a smaller level, of course, and there was an original idea for a program on, on, on you know, bits and bytes, if you like, of, of putting components together and, 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 and microelectronics down at that level. Um, but we were beginning to get hold of machines where you wrote programs for yourself. And of course, if you wrote programs for yourself, the only real language that there was available at that time uh, for beginners was basic and so we started to think that computer literacy was really about programs writing programs in basic and then we started looking at the number of machines that were around and there were many machines around and they all had different versions of basic and so we thought well if we're going to teach people how to get hold of machines and write programs uh, we have to do it systematically in some way how can we do this and we had a very important uh, consultant called John Cole who was the uh, chairman of the micro users in secondary education. Um, and they had a specification for BASIC. 
a, a structured basic, which they thought would be the best thing, you know, to teach people, if you like, because we we depended on consultants. We, you know, for all our programs, we weren't experts. We depended on people helping us to decide what to do. So um, John had this idea of a, 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 a form of basic that we uh, should exploit, should try and teach people how to use. And it, we, we called it Adopted Basic for Computers, ABC. And then we looked around and there were many, many companies uh, producing micros by then. This was 1980, 81. Um, and uh, we got all of the companies together in a room at Cavendish Square in London, BBC hosted it, the Department of Trade and Industry were there. We said to them, we would like to adopt this, um, like you to adopt this uh, adopted basic for computers, this form of basic on your machines, and we're going to do some systematic television programs to show people how to write software, okay? And they said, no chance. <laughs> We've got our basic, thanks on your bike. So um, we, we, we were left with a bit of a conundrum what to do. Um, and the next thing that we did, we looked around and, and, and thought, is there a machine which is not a, because the BBC's relationship with commercial organizations and advertising, of course, was very much more difficult in those days. Um, and so we thought, is there a machine that we could use systematically? And we were thinking of small, you know, small numbers of people. Um, that we could use systematically to um, exploit our adopted basic computers. And there was a company called Newbury, and they were producing a computer called the New Brain, but they were publicly funded. And this was all right, <laughs> in quotes. So we, we approached Newbury, and they said, yes, we can put adopted basic computers to put ABC on our machine, and it can do all the things that we want. And we had a sort of an idea of a specification. It was evolving all the time. One must remember this was a moving target all the time. Uh, and they, they went away and they tried to produce a machine, and effectively they failed. It was rather sad. They got something that, that, that did some, some things, but when you got it to do other things, it just wouldn't work. It kept crashing and so on and so forth. So in desperation, um, and I think this was the Christmas of 1980 to 81, John Cole and I <coughs> produced a specification um, for what we wanted a computer to have. Um, color, graphics, sound, a fully positive keyboard, access to, you know, ability to run a, a proper monitor, um, but also run on a television, a domestic television screen. A specification of, of requirements, really. And we sent this round to all the companies uh, that we could find in the UK. And we asked, because in those days we, we weren't in Europe and so the, the European thing didn't really um, come up. And uh, we asked them to see what they got in the pipeline that might meet our specifications. And we got a number of computer companies uh, responding to this uh, including Acorn, including Sinclair, and so on. And um, we studied these um, uh, machines that were in, in these various companies' pipelines to see which would be the most suitable. And we looked at the company's records, we looked at their attitudes, the extent to which they were prepared to produce expandable machines, the extent to which they were able to produce, to be, produce machines that we could use in studios because it was very difficult in those days to film television, uh, sorry, it, it was very difficult in those days to film computer screens. Many of them were running at 60 hertz, and you know, you get beat, beats when you, when you try and film them. Going out filming in America was an absolute nightmare, uh, because all the screens rolled and the film speed had to be changed and so on and so forth to, um, you know, to stop the roll. So if you're doing cutaways and close-ups of computer screens, it was a nightmare, absolute nightmare. So we wanted a machine that we could use in studios and so on. And these companies produced their, their offerings, if you like, and we went and visited them systematically round and round. And we had a group of people that included the Department of Trade and Industry and um, the BBC Research and Development um, and, uh, the, the, um, and people like John Cole and Muse and, and other people who were, you know, pretty clued up about computers. And we've, we judged these various offerings 
the various computer uh, companies that were offering um, and were very keen to, you know, to make a, a machine with the BBC's name on it. Um, and we, we eventually ended up by saying Acorn uh, had won the contract. And it was quite controversial. Um, but we think we made the right decision in the end. Because Acorn were prepared to, A, to adopt our general philosophy, more or less adopt our idea of the structured basic, but also they had their own ideas of basic. And this was evolving all the time as well. But they were also interested in building the things the BBC wanted to go with the machine. For example, a teletext decoder. Very important that I'll come on to the telesoftware. Telesoftware is a big part of the story, actually. Um, and they were a very good company to work with. And the specification, the spec, sorry. But they didn't just stop at the spec, they carried on. They carried the on. The Music 500 for music yeah. generation, the Prestel adapter, um, what else do they have? Co-processors, all the co-processors yeah. where you could use a BBC Micro as a platform to run whole different processors, even a, an early IBM PC like add on board, they didn't just stop there. The kind of characters you thankfully found in Acorn behind the scenes partly had the, the drive to continue beyond the BBC spec. The BBC spec was fantastic. It yeah. says the, the, the feeds to the studio, the BBC was a delight to work with because we could mm. actually take the red, green and blue signal out of the, the computer, lock to the studio signal yeah. and have the best pictures out, which if you're looking yeah. at listings, which we were brave enough to do, yeah. you got the best quality straight out of the computer, straight onto the TV system, yeah. you know, even in those days. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was absolutely crucial. Yeah. Uh, and it was quite difficult to get it to work initially, I think. Mm. Um, well, some of my colleagues in the department yeah. I borrowed from, John Mitchell designed the board, and yeah. Acorn adopted it in the end and built some for us. Yeah. But the, the Genlock card, because of the way the BBC Micro was designed inside, it was able to be modified to allow us to do a Genlock feed to it, and a decent sound output yeah. as well. Yeah. Which so it became, it became a, a, an output in the studio. It's like, it's like having an extra camera. Uh, you, could, you could cut to it and you, you knew you got like a very clean picture. Uh, none at all. Um, I'd, uh, I got it, I, when we were beginning to look at, the, at what we should do, I went and got, got, got a computer. It was, a, it was Tandy TRS-80 actually. Um, and uh, I also bought components and started, you know, soldering them together and got little LEDs to light up and, and built gates and things like this. And I got quite interested at that level. But um, the, uh, the actual, uh, if you like, content of the programs was really uh, a joint effort with, with, all, with our consultants, you know. They'd say, we, we really ought to deal with this topic and this topic and this topic and this is how we should do it and this is the kind of code we should get people to learn to write. And of course you got hold of the thing yourself and tried it out. Um, but it's, a, it's quite a busy business making television programs, so you can't do everything. But um, anyway, um, but the voice of the techie here, you see, uh, Steve um, understands computers much more than I do. Yeah, I think because I grew up with electronics and so much was dumb up until about the 80s. All the products we had were dumb products. And mm. I think as a techie, you always <coughs> crave to put a bit of intelligence into a product. And the, when I was given my first BBC Micro, when I was volunteer for the project, to mm. discover something inexpensive with so much capability was fantastic. Mm. With a good, as you say, structured basic within it. Um, so I enjoyed writing yeah. all of the software for the latest series because you could you get stuff done that five years previously you just, just couldn't get done Absolutely. quite often overnight. You'd say, yeah, I don't want yeah. that, we want that instead. Sure. So you sit there until midnight rewriting it. And voila, here was a clever bit of software. Um, don't look under the bonnet because it was fairly rough underneath, but it worked. And that yeah. was the point of the program. Sure. For, for the viewer, they saw exactly what, what they wanted and achieved by something that wasn't available five years previously. It yeah. was a, a versatile thinking machine that could do just what you wanted. So once you get that, once you get the inspiration mm. thinking, at last any device from a thermostat, it's taken 30 years to get an intelligence thermostat, but people picked up the idea in the end, um, to even things like cars. Cars, when we started, didn't have any kind of engine management or no. warning when your service came out. All those things which were so dumb and yeah. unmanaged and un unmonitored suddenly became a practicality yeah. a possibility. Well, it was the beginning of so many things. I remember going in, and we did an interview with people in um, Lucas Industries. You remember Lucas mm. talking about engine management systems and how computers were creeping in there and creeping everywhere. That's something I want to come back to, um, which is the, 
when we uh, commissioned the machine, we thought we've got to have some software. Now, software in those days almost didn't exist. I mean, you know, uh, uh, cost software for, for, for the average punter for the, and for the consumer just, just really didn't exist. There were business programs where you, you know, had green text on a, on a black screen and that was it. And it was nearly always scrolling, wasn't it? Um, but we had a machine that was able to do color, uh, was able to do, um, had various different graphics modes to various different resolutions. It could produce double height teletext characters. So you were able to do big letters, small letters, change the colors, have music behind the thing, and having, have, have screens that changed instead of scrolled. And this, uh, it, it's very difficult at the moment to think back to a time when, when software was so crude. And I commissioned the welcome tape, which was the tape that came with the BBC Micro. And in those days, you loaded programs off cassette tape. Um, and it was quite difficult to persuade. Um, I remember meeting with Acorn um, saying, we, we've got this uh, um, tape that will help, which will have a lot of programs on it and we want to be able to stop and start the tape. So we needed a little relay inside the computer which would stop and start a tape recorder. There was a, an in sharp intake of breath, it's gonna cost, cost a lot. Um, and they worked out it was gonna cost another 30p <laughs> to put this into the machine. Because you know, the cost of the machine was escalating. It wasn't a cheap machine, but it was a very versatile machine. Anyway, we uh, commissioned uh, the welcome tape and it had a whole series of programs on um, which changed from one to the next. And, you know, one of them might be um, putting some words into, you type in a, a group of words and it would sort them into alphabetical order. Uh, there was a, a program with a, an interactive quiz uh, where you could, um, you know, put in your answers and you either got them right or wrong. There was a, an interactive poem that Roger Mogoff wrote, um, where depending on what, put, what you wrote in, the, the, the poem would go off in one direction instead of another. And there were a whole series of these um, um, things which illustrated, if you like, the different things that computers could do, all right? Um, and we, this, this coincided with the interest that the government showed in the, in, the, in the machine. And Kenneth Baker, who was Minister for Information Technology, um, took a huge interest in, in what we were doing. Um, and this, by this time, it was Mrs. Thatcher in control and um, Mrs. Thatcher got interested in putting computers into schools. But when we were launching the project itself, before the schools project really got off the ground and machines started going into schools, we had a meeting with all the DTI ministers and there's a wonderful photograph of a row of DTI ministers, including Norman McGregor, who I think ran, uh, McGregor ran, ran uh, the railways, there's Norman Lamont, and there's Kenneth Baker, and, uh, and, 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 and um, Patrick Jenkin, all sitting in a row, all sitting with BBC Micros, all saying, oh, it's a bit like a typewriter, isn't it? <laughs> and, and, all, and, and I remember Patrick Jenkin, he, um, he who invented the poll tax, um, sitting in front of the, 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 the machine, and we ran the welcome tape. And uh, they, they, he was sitting there saying, Patrick Aloysius St. John Jenkins, Secretary of State for Industry, press return, you know, and those words would then put themselves into alphabetical order. <laughs> but it's very funny, they did, they, they, you know, we introduced all the DTI ministers to computers in that, in that it's strange little session. Did they actually uh, get it, do you think? Did they actually see how important it was? Yes, I think they did by then, yes, I think they did. Uh, there was great support from the government, and very shortly after that, it's quite difficult to, in your mind to, in my mind, to sort of fix a date because things were moving so fast. But suddenly the Micros in Schools project uh, came along and um, I remember talking to Mrs. Thatcher and trying to explain to her about telesoftware, which is the other thing I want to, to talk about. One of the, um, the add-ons for the machine was, a, a mach was something that the BBC was very keen on and this was a teletext decoder. We had teletext, you remember, the top two lines of the television image um, <laughs> contained data. You could little see little ants running along the top of the screen. And you had pages of information. Not anymore. But not anymore. <laughs> you had pages of information which, um, you know, the news, sport, results and everything else. And we thought you could use this to send software uh, by television uh, so that schools, for example, or 
punters generally, could download software quite slowly, but you know, overnight perhaps, uh, into their machines using this decoder and then run the programs. And what would they record it on? They would record straight into the adapter. The teletext adapter would take the TV feed and would then load directly via one of the interfaces into the BBC Micro the program. So there was no, yep. there was the, the adapter, the BBC Micro, and your TV feed. Yeah. It ran about as slowly because it was going through the CFAX pages, so you had to get to the right page and download just one screenful and then wait for that yeah. page to come around again. It wasn't fast, but it was a great way and reliable, oh, uh, error-free way of getting that that's uh, right. uh, listing. It was about 1K per page, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Something like that. But it worked. I mean, and, 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 and for a time, there was some tele software that actually ran. But the BBC, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, one of the questions she asked me is, how is the BBC going to make money out of this? Um, and it soon got taken over. The tele-software service started up, and it then got taken over, really, by commercial ex uh, uh, users uh, who paid to put data on. And, for example, betting shops would get results uh, that could be sent by CFAX, and they could download them. So these were sort of closed uses, uh, uh, closed us users, if you like, of, of the tele-software service, but the, it was a commercial service, and the BBC ran it for some years, and then it, then it closed down. For one thing, they, um, I don't know whether the... Uh, well, someone invented the internet. Someone invented the internet. That, <laughs> my, I knew there'd be a reason. Yes, <laughs> no. it's usually yes. a reason. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so, going back to about 1982, uh, we started producing the very first series, which was called The Computer Programme, now, this was uh, in production for a good, a good long period before the machine was actually ready. The machine was in the pipeline, the programs were being made, um, but you couldn't really say that the programs were about how to use the computer. And also, they were being made by Paul Krivacek, who was um, really a sort of philosopher, a philosopher rather than a techie. Um, and he was more interested in making a series about computing. So the computer program is really a series about computing in the wider sense, with some reference to the micro. There are moments where, I think it was a five-minute item, we were out uh, loading from cassette oh, yeah. and read an input. So it, it, you're right, it was impact. But also some of the, the raw coding, you wouldn't dare cover now on TV, no. appeared in that series as well to get That's people right. to sit down. So what is this? How does the keyboard talk to the screen? When I press on the keys, do the numbers and the letters directly appear on the screen? Yes. No, this is how it works. Yes. It really was looking it was at the a very nuts and bolts level. of the computer. Yeah. And, and why do you yeah. say you would be seeing that sort of thing nowadays? I think people, I think the perception is that people need to be entertained second by second. And mm. what all our series did was entertain and inform. Mm. The millions of people we got to watch our programs mm. enjoyed finding out about things they had no idea about. Yes. And because we, um, the computer program was no exception, MicroLive more so, because that was, I think, had a, a fun element to it as well, um, made it fun to be informed about how things worked, even whether yeah. you wanted to know about it or not. People were keen to be mm. informed and educated whilst they're being entertained on television. It's but a see, thing that yeah. has perhaps faded away a bit in the concept. Well, the culture's changed TV's because made. it's now, didacticism is a dirty word, mm. really. You shouldn't be explaining things, you know, because we're much more, you know, people have got to discover them for themselves or, you know, whatever. Yeah, you, you find very little uh, in the way of didactic, you know, explanatory uh, documentaries or programmes. I mean, in those days, we had programmes um, which were teaching people languages, for example, uh, you know, which came out of the education department. They looked like ordinary programs, but they were tucked away at each end of the schedule. But they came, uh, they were general programs, but they were teaching people uh, skills. Um, and we had um, the idea that um, you were teaching people bodies of knowledge. And computing was a body of knowledge, you know. Um, so it was, it was the right thing for that time and the education departments were, had their own dedicated airtime. It's very important to remember this. We had our own control of educational broadcasting. She's the one who, in fact, asked me you know, to look into this. Sheila Innes, she uh, had a, a number of departments uh, under her, schools television being one of them. Uh, schools television programs were labeled as schools television and they did systematic stuff. So we were able to um, say, we want to put this stuff on and there was no one to say no. Well, the channel controllers could have said no, 
but uh, in the end the channel controllers thought it was rather rather good but the interesting thing we did an awful lot of research and we had in those days a whole series of education officers uh, BBC education officers all around the country who would go into schools, go into colleges, um, see the way that programs were being used and so on and so forth. And there was a lot of research done into what people wanted. And we found there was a mounting interest in, in computing. It was beginning to get into public awareness, partly because of the, program, the other programs we made, I suppose, but also they were beginning to appear in the, in the high street. Sinclair's machine was on, was on, the, on the market, clearly. Uh, by 81, 82. Um, so there was a, a, a lot of interest, but also a lot of anxiety. People were concerned about computing. They didn't know what was coming, really, but they wanted to know about it. So what, what were the sort of worries that people were coming to you? Well, the things about um, structure of employment, you know, um, about uh, jobs, about routine jobs disappearing because computers could, could run them. I mean, clerical jobs are a very good example, you know. Data processing, um, the city. Data processing, no. The city, when we used to take um, pay chits, checks, and have to manually drive them across the country. That's why the bank shut early. All that stuff, the days where there was no interchange of banking or city data electronically. Yeah, right. It was a best of floppy disks, but it wasn't even that when the series started. Mm. It was handling around pieces of paper. Yeah. Enormous amount of data processing yeah. that was done manually, word yeah. processing. And my secretary in the future will be able to dictate to this thing called a computer. No, 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 no. No secretary, you're typing yourself. The secretary can get a worthwhile, even more worthwhile, useful job because she's no longer yeah. having to type your dictation anymore because you will use your word process yeah, for that. Right. Totally alien concept that's about that. That's true. The, the concept of how it's going to impact hadn't hit people, they didn't know what it meant. No. So, it, so there was a lot of concern, but it was largely enthusiastic interest. I mean, let's be fair. Uh, and so people, you know, getting, getting machines for Christmas presents and so on and so forth. Um, the interesting thing was the research we did about the audience uh, for these programs, we thought they would be largely, um, you know, be C, C2s or whatever it is, um, uh, wh white males, if you like. Uh, it turned out that there was a 50% split between women and men. And there was a, a broad range of, of, of ages interested in, 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 in learning about computers. It was quite extraordinary. So it, it really covered everybody. Whereas, you know, you had this view of, of the, the, the anorak sitting and watching the programs. It wasn't that. It was, it was families. It was, it, was, it was as many women as men. Very extraordinary result there. And we got very large audiences. Um, there were about two, two million people would watch a program, you know, probably going out quite late at night. But we got a lot of repeats. So that the, the, the programs were repeated uh, quite often. But by then it was, what, 7.30 in the evening, BBC Two? Uh, oh, the by the time, with, for Micro Live, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, Mainstream, but, main time TV? Yes, but also it was taken up abroad because the programs, um, starting with Silicon Factor, but then certainly with the, uh, the making the most of the micro and the computer program, they went on PBS in America, they went to Australia, they went to Canada, most of the, um, um, the, um, um, the empire countries, if you like, the, re the um, Commonwealth countries would take them. So they got very widely uh, distributed. And this helped the sales of the computer, because the sales of the computer were very high. Um, and I forget how many were sold in the end. I mean, it was certainly over 2 million, maybe 3 million. And initially, we were expecting what? In the tens of 10, thousands? 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What we could hope for? Oh, 3 million. Quiet. <laughs> it's interesting you're saying um, you were actually exporting this mm. and to the States yes. as well. So yep. this was an innovative Program, uh, the concept of yes, it was. Yep. The, the, the yes, so in a sense, in terms of awareness, we were leading the world, but we weren't leading the world in exploitation of the, of the technology. But that's the irony. And of course, the BBC's name in those days was, um, was uh, its position really uh, was, was very much greater. It was said to be, the BBC was said to be the world's second best known logo, or thing, after Coca Cola. Mm. I don't know whether it is now, I doubt it. It's probably Google or something like that. Um, Apple. Like. Sorry? Apple. Apple? I think Apple is the most respected product. The BBC is not there mm. in, near the top yeah. because we still manage to get quality programmes out despite yeah. the change. Yeah. But it was a very different BBC. 
And of course, uh, BBC Engineering was very strong. BBC Research was very strong. And it's worth saying that one of the benefits from the BBC um, Micro uh, was that the BBC got involved in sending data using television to devices in the home. Now, if you think about that, that is the set-top box, right? So a lot of the patents and all the early uh, um, sort of um, techniques, if you like, the BBC effectively owned them. And it's probably saved the BBC a lot of money in the sense it doesn't have to license uh, use of software and techniques from, from other people. So uh, quite a lot of benefits, I think, hidden benefits came out from the machine. Um, besides the obvious effect on, on, um, on the software industry. Now the biggest, I suppose the most important thing that happened when the machine came out is that people started writing serious programs for it. Um, and we published some, BBC, Edu BBC um, Enterprises, uh, which is now BBC Worldwide, um, you know, produced software. Um, you'd have people like Witch, you know, which the consumer magazine would produce a tax calculator for the machine. Um, there were lots of games that were, uh, were developed and serious programs began to appear for education. And the microelectronics micro and education program, which the government supported, um, produced a huge amount of educational software. So there was a great period of, of flowering of, uh, of software and also f a, a creation of a very important uh, group, age group, if you like, of people who learnt to program at that time and who are now at the top of um, IT companies and so on and so forth and remember that they started with the BBC Micro or, you know, or other machines of the kind. So that's, I think, an important um, legacy. Well, a lot of suspicion inside the BBC. I mean, a lot of a lot of a lot of production people thought this wasn't the right thing to do, and that we shouldn't be associated with a commercial machine, or our name should be going onto onto a machine. Um, and in fact, one of our programmes it was the second MicroLive program, I think, where Bill Cotton comes on mm. and said, uh, you know, jolly good, this is just important. You know, <laughs> we're doing it because it's important, um, and that the the, the uh, I think you might not get away with it nowadays. So in you've, nowadays you've got um, BBC's into partnerships with people, the, the new micro bit and the, and the um, computers, um, the, the new computer um, coding, um, year of code project is effectively a partnership with a very large number of companies and they can get away with, with that in, 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 in the way that we couldn't have done, I think, uh, in our day. We, you know, if you, if, sorry, if you tried to do now what we did then, you probably wouldn't be able to, because you'd have to send it out to everyone in Europe anyway, and I suspect that the BBC would be in a very much more difficult position, but partnerships are the thing nowadays, so the, all the new stuff that's, that's in the pipeline um, is very much being done by, by partnerships. At the end of the Making the Most of the Micro series, so we'd had two series by then, we'd had 300,000 letters coming in, we had broadcast support services who dealt with queries and so on, and we thought, this is, we ought to do something. So there was a special programme, and we took over the whole of BBC One, imagine doing that nowadays, the whole of BBC One uh, for a special, and it was called Making the, Mac Making the Most of the Micro Live. It was a live programme. Two hours. Two hours, um, uh, of which only an hour and a half was recorded by the BBC. Yeah, <laughs> We're still looking for it. <laughs> yes, anyway. Anyone out there who's got a, a, a full copy of the programme? Um, and uh, this uh, meant that we did things, we did, the, we did demos live, and there was a very famous it, um, 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 part of the programme where some hackers broke in. We were doing a demonstration of electronic mail, which was absolutely new in those days. And uh, they broke in and hacked in. There was a, there's a hacker's song came up on the screen. How and did they do that? We've got several <laughs> theories. Steve I, knows. I, I think the most basic theory, obviously it was something that no one in Telecom Girl wanted to happen. No. And we followed that as much as we could. Some of our guests were hackers. I'm only guessing here. We then fit presenters with radio mics. 
and the last moment you get tell, you tell the presenters what the password is with your radio mics on, that is my suspicion. Alternatively, the password to get into Telecom Golf with this account before mm. dead television time was a very short password, something you'd never do nowadays. I believe it's just a two-letter password. Mm. So how many permutations as a hacker do you have to go through? Yeah. 26 times 26 and you're in. So one of those two, or perhaps a combination of both, got them into yeah. it. But I was in the, I was in the gallery because I was you know in control of the thing. In fact, I wasn't directing it, but I was in control of it. And so editorially, you have to you see this thing happen, and you're desperately scanning it, looking for obscenities. But fortunately, there weren't any obscenities. But it was it was something that was um, a, a hell of a shock at the time, and uh, we just coped with it as best we could. But fortunately, Mac was very good. That one of our presenters, Ian McNaught Davis, who unfortunately died last year. Um, was brilliant at, at, at thinking on his feet. He wasn't so good at reading an autocue, but he was very good at thinking on his feet. And he, he also knew about computing. And, I think uh, that was a good thing. The presenters on all our shows, handpicked by yourself, were the right mix of sceptical. They weren't techie yes. nerds. You look at some foreign series, and it's all very worthy, and it's all terribly insular, small industry stuff. Yeah. But with people like Mac, who was brilliant, as you say, in a live situation, and to he had, a, he had a really healthy disrespect for micros. That's right, poxy little micros. <laughs> <laughs> What's this poxy little BBC micro? Bloody games. Yes, because he that. ran a big computer um, uh, service company that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, serviced large, large, uh, large, large industrial companies and so on. Yeah. yeah. So I think that made a, a more approachable series. All of them are more approachable series. Letty Judd certainly didn't understand about computing, but that... That was good. No, she, but she was a good broadcaster. Yeah, she was you a see? fantastic yeah, She could cope with the going around the uh, television centre in the C5, trying to uh, dial the, our American uh, reporter in, who's in America on the, you know, the first ever proper uh, uh, portable phone um, uh, phone call, international phone call, and uh, it not getting through. Uh, three times she tried it, do you remember? Mm. And of course, if you're a live program and you've only got a, you've got 30 minutes, you've got to come out at 29 minutes and 30. And your satellite time, an analog and your satellite, satellite time is running so out because it costs a fortune. So, you know, oh, I give it one more go, Leslie, you know, because we can always drop an item if you, you know. There were very few people around, you know, at, at these days you would have a lot of computer journalists you could look on or people. Um, you know, with, with much more experience of, of that kind of, of thing, who'd be much more at ease with the technology. But in those days, there was virtually nobody. Ian McNaught Davis was, was known for, um, he, he uh, did some programs on climbing because he was a mountaineer. He'd done programs on animal, vegetable, mineral, I think. Um, so he was chosen because he knew about computers, but he knew about big computers. So series one had Chris Searle as the naive presenter with Mac as the guest e expert, all right? So Mac would say, this is what you do, and, and, and uh, Chris Searle would, would, would try it out and would do all the links, and, because he was the professional, but he was also the man in the street. In series two, um, Mac was the presenter, um, but he didn't know much about micros. As I say, he talked about the poxy little micros. And John Cole, who'd been our uh, advisor in many ways and was very important. Again, unfortunately, John died last year too. What was his background? His, he, he was um, head of uh, computer studies at um, uh, Oundle School and he was chairman of the micro users in secondary education um, uh, group, which were very important. And, and he, just, he just was a chap, you know, you could talk to him and was very good at explaining things and he became the the person who told Mac about how you use the micro to do things. So it worked quite well. And when we came to MicroLive, um, we wanted, because it was live, we needed people who could cope with live television. And Leslie, of course, had done Blue Peter. Right, Leslie Judd. Leslie yeah. Judd, yes. Um, and uh, Fred Harris came in and he'd done um, oh, lots, of lots of stuff. But Fred knew about science. He, he, he was a mathematician and uh, he, 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 you know, has computers in the attic uh, just like you. <laughs> yep, probably the same. Bats in the belfry, computers <laughs> in the attic. Um, anyway, the, 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 I suppose we ought to get back to go, go to MicroLive. Um, so the idea came about for, for doing a live program where we showed um, 
it was really carrying on the idea. We'd shown people what the principles were, but all sorts of things were happening in the market. So we could show new things that were happening in the market. New technologies were coming along. Um, electronic mail is, is an obvious early one. Mobile phone was, was, was coming along then, of course. Um, and uh, so the idea of doing a program which was live, topical, you know, brought you up to date on what was going on. I mean, the nearest thing now, I suppose, is um, um, the, the television program. Well, it's Click, isn't it? It's Click now, I suppose. Except um, that's editor. I think it was so important to do live because people could trust you if you were showing a live connection to a database at £30 a minute um, on your acoustic coupler and they knew it was live. Yes. They could connect to that. They couldn't do on an edited program. Click is a lovely, slick remnant of IT production going out. But yeah. it's, it's remote because it's not live. No, the that's things right. that took yes. the time took the time on yeah. live. And when things did go wrong, often in a slight way, but in a real way, that gave people more connection with what we're talking about. Yeah. Demonstrating something like a, a connection to a database, which in those days was expensive. It was pounds per minute for access to one database. Yeah. But we showed that happening with a live computer, live acoustic coupler, mm. phoning the number, mm, it's engaged, try again. That all made it real and approachable yeah. to the viewing public. It wasn't, there wasn't the fear in the back of the viewing public's mind, oh, this is too slick, because they saw the moments where it went wrong slightly and therefore connected more with what they could do yeah. as well and not to fear that odd moment sure. themselves when they're trying it back home. The live was so important. And I think because the presenters are working that pace as well, it made it a more fun experience, but mm. it, was, it was a real experience, a real tangible experience yeah. people could, could relate to more than the early series, yeah. which were pre-recorded and edited. Yeah, uh, all sorts of people in the BBC said, why are you doing it live? Is it, um, you know, it ties up, the, it, it means that studio has to be that for, the, for you at that particular time. Why can't you do it on a Sunday morning you know, instead, of, instead of on a Friday night? You know? um, and the simple answer was it, was it was live because it made people pull their fingers out. Things didn't go wrong. Whereas on the whole, if you recorded it in chunks, you'd spend time, I said, well, I'm sure we, we could do that a bit better, or, you know, it didn't work because someone wasn't concentrating and something like that. And, uh, and, and the liveness, it was, a, it was a bit like Tomorrow's World. People liked Tomorrow's World and they enjoyed it when it went wrong, provided people coped with the thing going wrong in the right way. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have very much you look back on the well, so Unfortunately, unfortunately, we <laughs> didn't have very much going wrong. Yes, but, uh, we always enjoyed it. it when it did. I used to drive in every morning from home to the studio with the same piece of music. Uh, not that I'm a suspicious person, but there was a certain kind of rabbit's foot mentality in my mind as the guy who ultimately it was my my fault if it went wrong. I used to go in and have a certain little regime to keep the bad fairies away <laughs> <laughs> because it was live. It had to work. We everyone. Everyone gets their game up for that half hour's yeah. worth of live television, or in the early days, two hours worth of live yeah. television. That's people in front of the camera and behind the camera. The camera work, the sound, everybody, a team of, let's call it, 30 people are all concentrating mm. at the same time. And that, when it works right, works well. Yeah. Occasionally, yeah. you look back at some of the stuff we did, and the explanations aren't perfect. Compared with what was good about doing live, mm. that's mm. not important, because it was a far more approachable program by being live than yes. being pre-recorded and yeah. snipped and improved yeah. later. And occasionally it was very topical. Mm. We distributed this specification and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a full technical specification that would have been pages and pages and pages. We, we said we wanted certain it, to do certain things, okay? Sound, um, colour, all these, all these things. And we sent it to these companies. There were about half a dozen companies, and I forget the names of them now, uh, but they certainly included Sinclair and Acorn uh, and so on, and RML, I think RML. Um, and we then visited them to see what they had. And a lot of stuff was kind of, you know, under wraps to some extent. Um, and we certainly visited um, to talk about their general attitude to what we were doing. Um, and... Uh, some people were effectively just box movers, you know, CPM based, I think it was CPM, wasn't it called CPM based um, uh, machines. Uh, they weren't really, you know, into the business of developing anything. Um, Sinclair was, was there with, with his, his, his machines um, and we approached uh, Sinclair about 
the uh, you know he was he was one of the three three companies we we visited on one particular day. We visited Tangerine Computers in Ely, and they were CPM based sort of box movers, I think you could say. We then went to Acorn, and they said we've got something um, which you know looked quite interesting, but it isn't quite working. So could you come back later? And then we went to see Sinclair, and uh, Sinclair really was talking about. I suppose the spectrum um, in those days, because the ZX80 and the ZX81 were on the streets by then, but they weren't the sort of machine we we wanted. They were they were effectively too too flimsy, too too lightweight, le, le, with not enough expandability and so on and so forth. So we didn't know what he was up to, uh, but he was effectively talking, I think, about the spectrum. Uh, and when we said we wanted a fully positive keyboard, by which we meant a you know solid solid keys, um, he um, waved the uh, Spectrum uh, flexible keyboard at us, saying that's a fully positive keyboard, which we didn't really think was the case. But um, anyway, the, they each came up with their various um, offerings, and we then made vis we visited subsequently and. Um, uh, eventually this group, I mean it was a group thing. Steve Ferber, uh, who's now a professor in, uh, in, in Manchester, um, Herman Hauser, who's now a serious entrepreneur, um, there was um, Andy Hopper, who's now a professor at Cambridge, um, San, um, uh, Sophie Wilson as she became, um, and I can't remember the others, um, Chris Curry, of course, yeah, but Chris, Chris was the business manager, I think, rather than the, 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 the technical guy. Anyway, they had uh, a machine there which was extremely promising and, and seemed to meet a lot of our requirements. Uh, I think it was going to be the Proton, um, but it was certainly, you know, color, sound, all those uh, graphics, all those things. So, um, and they, they had a very good attitude uh, towards um, you know, wanting to cooperate with us, wanting to be flexible, wanted to, you know, take on the, the, the things that the BBC Engineering were interested in, 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 in doing. They were very happy to make it a machine that was studio friendly and so on. So it's, it was an evolutionary process, but the development uh, of the relationship was quite good. But what sort of size were they at the time? I mean, how did they, they stand in relation to the other computer manufacturers at the time? I suppose... Well, we didn't see any manufacturing, so we didn't see, you know, we didn't see where they were making things. Um, but uh, so I, I think the it answer is they, were, they weren't it? a big building. No, they weren't a big group. They were a small, high-powered group. But uh, so many developers. other manufacturers of computers at that time were small as well. Yeah, they were all small. Yeah. It was the brains, and thankfully, I mean, almost a blessing that it was a company that had the brains available to talk to the BBC. The, the, the intelligence, the cleverness was there directly approach one and still allowed to talk. Yeah. You get a bigger organisation and perhaps you then have marketing and sales and research and by the time the customer of the BBC turns up, the filtering to the techies is too much and you don't get what you really wanted, whereas we yeah. had direct techie requirement to incredibly uh, capable techies in Acorn. It, yes. it was a good, good choice. Yeah. They were in small premises, um, you know, in a building in central Cambridge, as, as was Sinclair. Um, uh, in fact, they were only about 100, 100 200 yards apart, I think. Um, so they were all quite small outfits. Um, and of course, one didn't know what manufacturing stuff there was, you know, lurking in the background. Um, so we were really dealing with prototypes, seeing prototypes and seeing things working. Um, and then, of course, one of the groups um, who were in the, one of the companies that was in the, in the list was Newbury who were still beavering away, away trying to get the machine to work. And it was, uh, it was really very tragic that they, um, they completely failed, really. They tried to get a machine that would run efficiently from a small box with a very small uh, screen on it uh, that also joined up and, and played through a television and through a monitor and they could never get these, these all to, to work. The picture, was, the picture quality wasn't good. 
the um, it's difficult to remember now I mean they used to come along and they were very we were very friendly with them uh, and in the end had they succeeded about you know six months earlier than you know, we might have had the, the new brain as the, as the BBC. I'm market. guessing because it wasn't around. I think yeah. probably what we'd asked for as the BBC was impossible for anyone to achieve in the time scale. But we needed that quickly to make the series work. Mm. And Acorn had a lucky break, if you like, because if you look at the interviews between um, Steve Ferber and Roger Wendy Wilson, mm. then they, Herman said to them, I want this done by kind of tomorrow. They went, you're impossible. And he mm. misquoted the other one saying, well, I can do my side. And so he went back to each of them and said, well, the other one says he can do it. And sure enough, they <laughs> were conned, <laughs> but they achieved the design that worked. Yes. But it was that close. It was, as you've seen yes. in Micromen, part fiction, part fact. But you yes. saw in that the time scale. So BBC arriving in an hour. Is it ready yet? No, no, no. It is ready mm. now. It was that close. Mm. A bit unfair, but I think we, had, well, we definitely ended up with the right product. Yes. because of its capabilities. Herman, Herman uh, we, we need to talk to Herman about this. <laughs> he, he talks about the moment when he snipped a wire. It's a bit like, you know, cutting the right wire bef to stop the bomb exploding. Yes. He managed to snip <laughs> the right wire or join wires up at the moment that just made it work, and it just in time. Mm. Uh, funnily enough, I don't remember that, but... Um, you were still down the bottom of the stairs walking up. I was still up. walking up the stairs. <laughs> uh, what can we say? Um, BBC, the, the politics in the BBC was very difficult. And this was all, we got to pay huge uh, credit to John Radcliffe. John Radcliffe was the executive producer. I was the series producer, if you like. Um, and he was the executive producer, which means he wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day making of the programmes or anything of that kind. But he had to look after the politics of this. It's the first time the BBC, BBC Enterprises, as they were in those days, now it's BBC Worldwide, we're used to making fluffy toys, jigsaws, and books. And there was BBC Education Publishing as well. But they were used to things like that. They were, to get into selling computers, I mean, that was an extraordinary move. And it was, up to, it was really uh, John Radcliffe who um, worked with, um, with enterprises, persuaded them that it was something that they could, they could, you know, they might be able to work with and make some money out of, of course, in the end. Um, but also persuading BBC politics, the, the BBC management, that this was the right thing for the BBC to do, and I think it's it's a tribute to the challenge that people were seeing microelectronics was, you know, computing was at that time, that this sort of got through, you know. I think if it had been ten ten years later, you wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, but of course, the, the the interesting thing about the the whole parab it's a, like a parabola, really. Um, of um, the trajectory. We were, at, when everything was beginning to build up, it was just new, it was, uh, it was on the streets, it was, everyone was wanting one, and, it, and the Microlive series came along, and then halfway through Microlive, the bottom began to fall out of the market. People lost interest in buying machines. Um, they were already in the schools, the schools were using them, but people, you know, if they wanted to buy them, probably already bought them by now. Um, and this meant that the sales dropped, Acorn sales dropped. Acorn tried to launch uh, the machine, in, well, they did launch the machine in America because I went to the launch. Um, and uh, they didn't succeed, really, in, in selling the machine in America. I don't know quite why. It'd be interesting to ask Herman that. It may be because they didn't choose a, a strong American partner to work with, but also the American companies like Apple and, and Microsoft and so on were beginning to you know, come up, and it was very much the same period of time. Um, and of course, um, the other thing was that I think that um, people were beginning to get uh, software programs, uh, and you were beginning to get things like, you know, PowerPoint, um, word processing, you know, a Word, and all these com big commercial uh, packages that came in. Well, I think also partly because those packages were coming in, and people were being exposed at work to the early versions of spreadsheets and mm. word processors. Did they really, really want to go home after that and learn more computers? More coding, I think I've, yeah. I've seen, I've seen no, computers, although I've right. had enough of them. They're not particularly yeah. good because they're early ones anyway. Yeah. And do we really want to go and, I think I've learned about computers because they weren't then, by the end of our series, they weren't being shown what else they could do anymore. No. They just saw in the office, chained in front of their computer and their keyboard and their early mouse, doing dull stuff again, different mm. dull stuff. So 
we had the unique opportunity at the start to cover the capabilities of all computers before people were being overdosed with computers mm. on routine office tasks yeah. during the day. But you had uh, computers in schools being used for interesting things. I mean, if I was teaching science, I started off as a science teacher. If, if, I, if I had computers when I was teaching, that'd be wonderful. You know, it could control things, it could measure temperatures, it could plot graphs and, and, and things like that. It would be absolutely marvelous. You know, so there were things going on in education like that, but information technology, um, tended to end up by being how to use a spreadsheet, how to use a, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. And we went back to the thing we were fearing, which is that the computers were controlling us rather than we were controlling the computers. And I think that's the interesting thing that's happening now. There's this feeling that we need a new generation of people who know how to get dirty, get things done, you know, get their hands on and write things. Well, the, the, the machine was really the, the Model A and the Model B, those things we, we think of as part of the project. But then, of course, they went on well, was the and master produced well, the master. Which came along with yeah. the standard word processing spreadsheet packages. So yeah. it was the um, intent to um, include business packages of sorts with that. Mm. And then just as we were almost coming off air, the mm. Archimedes turned up. The Archimedes turned up, which was the, the first use of the arm wrist chip, yeah, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, we saw the first arm chip. Was it called the arm chip of the United States? Well, it was the Acon Risk. Yep. Um, yeah. I think we are, are perhaps penultimate program covered the first prototype Archimedes yeah. on, on the show. Yeah. So it was just coming out as a powerful yeah. machine. But why didn't it succeed? Maybe because we weren't doing TV programs about it. No, but also because you had Apple and, and yeah. um, Microsoft had opened up and there were thousands of PC and the, clones the around. The competition was for business PCs. Everyone went from the yeah. standard. What didn't we cover? A lot of the time we did cover things like non-standard interfaces for modems, for printers and all the rest. No one invented USB by the end of our series. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee hadn't given us the uh, World Wide Web quite yet. No. You come across so many people who mm. say, God, you were involved with that project. Thank you so much. You inspire me in my career. People in yeah. many positions across the UK particularly who have watched the series and as a result of that have pursued a career, been inspired <coughs> by that series. 30 right. years later, it's good enough to be reinvented with Make It Digital, the new BBC project, yeah. using the micro bit and the rest. I, I, I wish they were given a slot to do a series as well, because I do believe what we did so well to include the whole public was a live, inclusive program, yeah. TV program, which still can work, even with so many channels. People will sit down and watch and talk about programs. Microbit is using the technology available now, which is the internet. It has some brilliant programs, history of A Lovelace, for instance, fantastic mm. documentary, mm. but not a series that's been allowed yet that covers what is currently possible and no. doable if people are included in a TV series covering no. it. No. So that's what I'd love them to be given back in the BBC yep. again to do the similar, because there's so much capability now. Everything's got so much faster, so much cleverer, yep. and the interfaces are so much easier. Yep. A new generation to be inspired to do that, mm. or to just understand how their iPad works, yeah. rather than just picking it up and shaking it. But there is one area that I think we've missed, and actually is, it is important now, and that is robotics. We did a whole series called Computers in Control, um, uh, which we're very proud of, actually. And Steve um, we did, did lots of... did some fabulous stuff. There's lots of jokes about me. There's Binky the Mannequin. <laughs> Binky the Mannequin, or yeah. called Steve in one moment. Yeah, called Steve, There's an yeah. animatronic... Um, pneumatically controlled um, dummy driven by BBC Micro, which has got the basic <laughs> movements, a bit like me really. Yeah. Um, that was driven from BBC Micro via lots of actuators and the rest. We did yes. model lifts where the whole thing worked for real. It sensed overweight, doors opening, doors closed, pressing. I wrote that overnight badly, but it worked for a demonstration yeah. in the studio using Fisher Technic models uh, mm. with their motors, their sensors. Yep all knocked up on a BBC Micro. Fantastic, the whole Yes, concept. there's a wonderful line that Max says, here's something that Steve knocked up tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> it was always so true. Model. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I mean, Steve really worked his socks off to get those models working. It was a, it was a series I'm most proud of in a funny way, because it was only five programmes, but it took the whole of robotics and it systematically looked at, mm. at different bits of it. The, each programme sort of held together. And we used lots of examples. We were always going to America to film things. We had an American reporter and various other things like that. But if you want to see interesting robotics, you went to California. Uncle you know. Clunk. Uncle Clunk. <laughs> 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 
it's one QA of the, department, hundreds of uncle, one uncle of the, sort of, hello, this is... You must show a <laughs> clip of Uncle... Uh, yeah. Of the no, the robotic bears. That wasn't Uncle Clunk. Actually. Uncle Clunk. It was the same factory. Same factory. Yeah. yeah. This was a whole series of robotic bears who were going to be in pizza parlors, all computer controlled, and this was the quality control section of their of their factory. So the row, row, row of bears, all bashing drums with sticks like this. Very funny. Anyway. But that's uh, robotics is one area. In other words, making you know you think Sensing of the you control. think of the Internet of Things and so on and so forth, and computers controlling things. That's where the interest is now. I think the screen-based you know there's games, of course, and all that. And there's a series we yeah. made out of that with Microbit and with the <coughs> Pi, the miniature Pi. The bless them because they're inspired. Why is why is the Pi called an AMB model? Because they're inspired by the BBC Micro, that's why they called it the AMB model, because they <laughs> got so, no, no, it's true, they got so much out of the BBC Micro in their generation, when they came up mm. with the, found, the Pi Foundation, yeah. they named it in part based yeah. on the BBC, and there's so much capability with those new machines to measure, control, and as you say, be part yeah. of the, the Internet of Things, that let's do a series, let them do a series, we're retired.